for Faramir, captain of Gondor. To show his quality. Faramir. Today is the day for him to show his quality. Build me a army worthy of A standout hero in the Lord of the Rings. Faramir is unlike any typical warrior of Middle-earth. He shows that true heroism lies in wisdom, moral courage, and the choice to reject power for the greater good. Today we delve into Faramir's life from his overshadowed beginnings to his rise into one of the greatest heroes. Let us discover what truly makes him who he is in the full story of Faramir. Good speech. Nice and short. Leaves more time for drinking. <laughs> Born in 2983 of the Third Age, Faramir was the second son of Denethor II, the steward of Gondor, and his wife, Finduilas. From an early age, Faramir was overshadowed by his brother Boromir, who was by far favoured by their father. But despite this, the two were very, very close. And this bond only got stronger after the death of their mother when Faramir was just five years old. This early loss cast a shadow over Faramir's childhood, yet it also cultivated in him a profound depth of character and empathy. Unlike Boromir, whose nature leaned towards martial prowess and the valour of arms, Faramir displayed an inclination towards wisdom and knowledge. He was wise and learned in the scrolls of lore and song, a reflection of his broader interests in the world beyond the battlefield. This wisdom came in part from his interactions with Gandalf the Grey, who visited Minas Tirith many times and took an interest in the young Faramir, really influencing him. This, however, did not sit well with his father. As I said, Faramir's wisdom though extended far beyond just military tactics. He was a scholar at heart, with a profound reverence for the history and lore of Middle-earth. Faramir's decisions were often guided by the texts that he studied, allowing him to draw on the past to navigate the complexities of the present. For instance, his knowledge of the legends of Numenor and the history of the Ring informed his understanding of the weighty responsibility that came when encountering Frodo and the Ring. Unlike others who might have seen the Ring as a tool for power, Faramir recognised it as a peril to be avoided, a wisdom surely gleaned from his studies. His ability to apply the lessons of history to the dilemmas he faced underscored not only his intelligence, but also his profound sense of duty and moral clarity. Moreover, Faramir's relationship with his father, Denethor, the steward of Gondor, was marked by a struggle for approval and recognition. Denethor's overt preference for Boromir, coupled with his high expectations, cast a shadow over Faramir, shaping his resilience and humility. This familial tension underscored Faramir's actions and decisions, driving him to prove his worth not only through seeking glory, but through steadfast loyalty and service to Gondor. Despite the lack of his father's favour, Faramir's commitment to his people and kingdom remained unwavering, reflecting a depth of character that transcended the need for parental approval. His ability to remain compassionate, wise and principled, even when faced with Denethor's indifference, highlights the strength of his character and his intrinsic worthiness as a leader and son of Gondor. But as his life continued, it took a pivotal turn one day, or one night, with a prophetic dream. We hear about this when it was recounted by Boromir in the Fellowship of the Ring chapter of the Council of Alrond, where the verse speaks of the sword that was broken, a token of doom, and a halfling's crucial role. Seek for the sword that was broken, in Imladris it dwells. There shall be counsels taken, stronger than Morgul spells. There shall be shone a token, that doom is near at hand, for Isildur's bane shall be waken, and the halfling forth shall stand. This dream, recurring in 3018, was had three times by Faramir, and then on that third time, shared by Boromir also. In what may be seen as a coincidence, on the day after they shared this dream, Sauron attacked Osgiliath on June the 20th. The Battle of Osgiliath marked a dire confrontation where the forces of Gondor, led in part by Boromir and Faramir, clashed with the overwhelming might of Mordor and its allies, the Easterlings and the Haradrim. Boromir recounted at the Council of Alrond how they were outnumbered and spoke of a menacing power emanating from a great black horseman, a Nazgul and this was a contributing factor to Gondor's defeat. This battle saw the eastern part of Osgiliath fall and the last bridge across the Anduin destroyed, leaving only Boromir, 
Faramir and two others surviving by swimming to safety. The aftermath of this conflict allowed the Black Riders to begin their hunt for the One Ring in earnest, setting in motion the events that would lead to the War of the Ring. But going back to that dream for a moment, Faramir was now eager to seek Imladris because of it. However, the way was full of doubt and danger, so it was Boromir who took the journey upon himself out of a sense of duty and protection for his younger brother. Boromir, leaving on July 4th, undertook a 110 day journey to Rivendell, where the Council of Elrond convened on October 25th, 3018. This was actually a much harder journey than perhaps it should have been, but I have covered that in more detail in our full story of Boromir video, so if you wish to learn more about that, then please check it out. But anyway, as Boromir journeyed, Faramir remained in Gondor, taking up his role as the captain of Gondor's forces and the rangers of Ithilien. His leadership was characterised by both valour and restraint, marking him as a thoughtful commander who weighed the cost of battle. Despite his father's preference for Boromir and Denethor's growing despair, Faramir maintained his duty to Gondor with unwavering loyalty and courage. His role during the War of the Ring was crucial, not just in terms of military leadership, but also in his interactions with key figures such as Frodo Baggins, which would have lasting implications for the fate of Middle-earth. There are no travellers in this land, only servants of the Dark Tower. As the shadow of Sauron stretched further and further over Middle-earth, Faramir's role grew ever more critical. Sauron's previous attack on Osgiliath was said to be what truly started the War of the Ring, that was the first key moment of it. But nothing hit home harder than when Faramir heard somewhere in the distance the Horn of Gondor being blasted when he was still in Minas Tirith. And then, just a couple of days later, on February 29th, Faramir discovered Boromir's fallen body, flowing down the river Anduin in a funeral boat. What a horrific moment this must have been for him. It didn't take long after this, being on March 1st, where Faramir was moved and stationed in Ithilien, the green land east of the Anduin, where he led the rangers in guerrilla warfare against the forces of Mordor, disrupting their movements and gathering intelligence. In Ithilien, Faramir's command of the rangers exemplified his strategic prowess. He orchestrated guerrilla warfare tactics that significantly hampered the movements of Sauron's forces, showcasing not only his military acumen, but also his deep understanding of the terrain and the enemy's strategies. Under his leadership, the rangers ambushed Haradrim contingents, utilising the dense forests and hidden paths of Ithilien to their advantage. These skirmishes, though small in scale, played a crucial role in disrupting the supply lines and morale of Sauron's army, underscoring Faramir's ability to make impactful decisions with limited resources. His encounters with the Haradrim also highlight Faramir's honour in warfare. He did not seek needless bloodshed, but aimed to protect Gondor's borders with precision and strategic foresight. A big turning point in his life though came on March 7th, when Faramir encountered Frodo Baggins, Samwise Gamgee and the creature Gollum, taking them to Henneth Anun. Unlike many others who were tempted by the power of the ring, Faramir displayed extraordinary integrity. His encounter with Frodo and Sam in the Two Towers reveals much about his character. When Frodo and the heavy burden of the ring faced Faramir, the steward's son was given a formidable test. Let us take a look at his declaration from the Window of the West chapter for a moment. But fear no more, I would not take this thing even if it lay on the road, even if Minas Tirith was destroyed to the ground, and only I could save it, using the weapon of the Dark Lord for his salvation and my own glory. No, I do not want such a triumph, Frodo, son of Drogo. This underscores a profound moral conviction and a rejection of power for personal gain. In this moment, Faramir did what even his brother Boromir could not. He resisted the temptation of the ring, showcasing a strength of will and purity of heart that was rare in such dire times. Faramir's wisdom and foresight were further demonstrated in his dealings with Gollum and the trust that he placed in Frodo's quest. Despite the strategic advantage of that knowledge of the ring's whereabouts that could afford Gondor, Faramir chose to support Frodo's mission, understanding the broader implication of the ring's destruction for the world. He lets them leave that next day, and Faramir himself leaves Henneth Anun the following day on the 9th of March, making his return to Osgiliath. He would then attempt to return to Minas Tirith to meet with his father the next day. However, he was attacked by the Nazgul on their fell beasts. Fortunately, Gandalf was on hand to save him from this threat outside of the gates of Minas Tirith. 
Not that this would garner any sympathy from his father, especially after delivering the news of what happened in Ithilien to both him and Gandalf. So, Denethor ordered him to return back to Osciliath the next day. It would not last though, and again that following day, now up to the 12th of March, Faramir had to retreat to the Causeway Forts, which were two towers with battlements on each side of the northeastern gate of the Ramas Echo, from which a causeway ran over the flatland to the city of Osciliath. Faramir and his men could not stand up to Mordor's forces, and with now the assistance of Prince Imrahil of Dolamroth and his knights the next day, Faramir and the wounded survivors were taken up the Ramas Echo, being that road that ran for 12 miles over the Pelennor fields up to the great white city of Minas Tirith. The problem for Faramir here was that he had been struck by a weapon of the Nazgul, the Black Breath. Those struck with this poisonous breath would usually fall into a dark cold sleep that they would never recover from. His leadership during the defence of Osciliath and the retreat to Minas Tirith highlighted not just his tactical skills but also his bravery and self-sacrifice, so this injury and affliction by the black breath would be an unjust end for him. When the siege of Gondor started amidst the chaos and the shadow of despair hanging over Minas Tirith, a tragic turn of events unfolded as Denethor, overwhelmed by grief and madness, resolved to burn himself and Faramir alive on a pyre at Rath Dinan. Believing Faramir to be dead and succumbing to the deceit of Sauron through the Palantir, Denethor sought to end their line rather than witness the fall of Gondor. Faramir, unconscious and unable to defend himself, was saved from this grim fate by the timely intervention of Peregrine Took who sought the aid of Gandalf. The wizard arrived just in time to rescue Faramir from the flames, a moment that not only spared his life but also underscored the deep fractures within the Stuarts family and the psychological toll of the war on its leaders. This was not to say Faramir was completely saved though, he was still suffering the effects of previous wounds. However, Faramir was tended in the Houses of Healing and was healed by none other than Aragorn himself. It was there, in a moment of vulnerability, that the depth of his character was once again revealed. Suddenly, Faramir stirred, opened his eyes and looked at Aragorn, who was leaning towards him. The light of consciousness and love lit up in his eyes, and he said quietly, Lord, you called me. I have come. What do you order me? This is really a testament to his loyalty and service, even in the face of personal suffering. Faramir's leadership and actions during the War of the Ring were instrumental in the defence of Gondor and the ultimate victory over Sauron, yet it is his moral compass, his unwavering commitment to do what was right, and his ability to lead with both heart and mind that truly set him apart. In a world teetering on the brink of darkness, Faramir stood as a beacon of light, embodying the hope that even in the darkest of times, integrity and courage could prevail. As the war reached its climax and the future of Middle-earth hung in the balance, Faramir's contributions extended beyond just the battlefield. I do not believe this darkness will endure. In the aftermath of the War of the Ring, Faramir could finally leave the fields of battle and go to a world of healing and governance. As the world began to heal from the scars of war, so too did Faramir, and his journey began in the Houses of Healing in Minas Tirith. It was there, amidst the city's recovery, that Faramir met Eowyn, the White Lady of Rohan herself, recovering also from the despair that had gripped her heart and the physical wounds that she had suffered in battle. Their mutual journey of healing fostered a deep connection, one built on shared experiences, understanding and a new found hope. Faramir's gentle demeanour and wisdom provided solace to Eowyn, helping her to find purpose beyond the battlefield. In one of their most poignant exchanges, Faramir expressed his admiration and affection for Eowyn, saying, Then, Eowyn of Rohan, I will say that you are beautiful. In the valleys among our hills grow beautiful and bright flowers, and our maidens are even more beautiful, but I have not seen in Gondor either a flower or a maiden so beautiful and so sad. Perhaps only a few days remain for the world before the darkness comes, and when it comes, I hope to face it bravely. But my heart will be lighter if, while the sun shines, I can see you. You and I have both walked under the wings of the shadow, and the same hand brought us out of there." This declaration not only highlights Faramir's deep respect and love for Eowyn, but also his enduring hope and commitment to the future of their land. Their love blossomed in the wake of war, symbolising the possibility of renewal and joy after great hardship. 
Following their marriage, Faramir and Eowyn settled in Emin Arnon, nestled within the lush rolling hills of Athelion. Together they embarked on a journey of restoration, breathing new life into a land scarred by war. Their complementary strengths, Faramir's wisdom and Eowyn's resilience, fostered a period of remarkable renewal. They worked hand in hand to replant forests, restore streams, and rebuild homes, transforming Athelion into a haven of peace and natural beauty. This era of rejuvenation under their leadership not only healed the landscape, but also the hearts of those who called Athelion their home, symbolising hope and the promise of new beginnings. Faramir and Eowyn's marriage was a union of strength and healing, bringing together Gondor and Rohan in a bond that would strengthen the ties between the two kingdoms. And following the coronation of Aragorn as King Elisar of the reunited kingdoms of Gondor and Arnor, Faramir was appointed the first Prince of Ithilien. His new role was not just titular. Faramir was tasked with the stewardship of the land, leading a restoration and ensuring its prosperity. Faramir's stewardship ensured that the horrors of the past would not define the future of its people. Faramir and Eowyn's life together in Emin Arnon brought them at least one son, Alboran who would inherit his father's titles and responsibilities, ensuring that the legacy of Faramir's leadership would endure through the generations. Faramir lived to the age of 120, a testament to his Dúnedain lineage and the favour of the Valar. His passing marked the end of an era, but his legacy lived on, not only in the annals of Gondor's history, but in the hearts of all who were touched by his wisdom, bravery and compassion. The respect and love he garnered from his people were unmatched, a reflection of his profound impact on Middle-earth during some of its most turbulent times as well as its most peaceful years. In Faramir, Tolkien crafted a character whose prowess laid not on the field of battle, but instead in his capacity for love, wisdom and courage. And that is not just for himself, but for all the peoples of Middle-earth. His life after the War of the Ring really just emphasises this point. Tolkien's own reflections on Faramir reveal a deep personal connection to the character. In his letters, Tolkien confessed that Faramir was the character he most identified with, stating, As far as any character is like me, it is Faramir. Except that I lack what all my characters possess. Let the psychoanalysis's note, courage. This admission is particularly telling, offering insight into the values and ideals that Tolkien himself cherished. Faramir's disdain for war, his love for law and wisdom, and his moral integrity are in many ways a reflection of Tolkien's own worldview. Tolkien's identification with Faramir underscores the character's significance beyond the narrative. Faramir embodies the themes of wisdom, compassion, and the quest for peace that are woven throughout The Lord of the Rings. His character serves as a counterpoint to the war and strife that define much of the story, offering a vision of what could be when the dust settles and peace is restored. So there we have it, Faramir is truly one of the greatest leaders from the Lord of the Rings. He shows us that being wise, being kind and doing what is right makes a great leader. It really tells us that you don't need to be the strongest or the loudest to make that big difference in the world. His journey from being unnoticed to one of the greatest leaders on the planet really tells its own story. It is inspiring. It teaches us to be brave in our own way and do what is right for everybody, not just for ourselves. Faramir's story is simply a reminder that real power lays in our choices and in our hearts. And with that now it is time for my question of the day which is, Tolkien said that he closely identifies with Faramir, but which of Tolkien's characters do you find most relatable? Let me know who and why in the comment section down below. And now it is time to give a massive thank you to our patrons who continue to support the channel, you are all amazing. And if you have reached the very end of this video with me today and you haven't subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so, it would massively help us out. And why not drop a like on the video as well? And with that, all I can say is, thank you for spending just some of your time with me today, and I will see you next time on The Broken Sword. Today.